hearts. So a vertex starts, you want to close up a path, you go from top, bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom, top. That's how many number of edges. Right? Because they alternate top, bottom, top, bottom. Okay, and if you use that fact, you can show that this is um, non plane by using the same argument. Now, these two guys, this is called K33 because it's got two parts, a top and a bottom, three vertices in each. This graph and this graph are the obstructions to being planar. And that's Kuratowski's theorem that was mentioned before. And that theorem tells you that every graph that is not planar, every graph that cannot be drawn in the plane, has one of these sitting inside of it as what we call a minor. And I'll talk to you more about that in a minute. Okay, so I'll ask you a good question. Yes. Ask your K5 proof here. When you put one point on the inside, does on the outside, right? When you claim that, you can draw a line and you'll be crossing. Yes. And I guess you'll need to use some results from analysis, right? Yes, you need the Jordan. You need the Jordan. Okay, okay. You just need the Jordan. Curve. So it's not that that easy. Trivial. Yeah. No, it's not trivial, but you intuitively it's okay. It is. It is. Yeah. Yes. That you've got inside and outside. So, but that definitely relies on analysis for some things. That's good. Um, so this is Kuratowski's theorem. Uh, I'm going to come back to that. So we know what three connected means. We know what planar means. Cubic. Okay. Well, what's a cube? Well, you know what a cube is. You see it every day. This whole campus is covered with cubes. There's a cube. That's a drawing of it. And a graph is called cubic if every vertex meets exactly three edges. So, of course, the graph of the cube is a cubic graph, but that's the definition. Every vertex has to go through. That meets three edges. Okay. The graph's got a Hamiltonian cycle. What's a Hamiltonian cycle? <coughs> it's a way of wandering around the graph and hitting every vertex exactly once. Can you do that in this graph here? Can you wander around the graph? So let's start here. you've heard of Hamiltonians in somewhere in mathematics? Well, this is named after a game that that mathematician introduced, which was it's called Around the World, and it was a peg and board game which was involved finding a Hamiltonian cycle in a particular brain. Uh, the Dodo of the Eagle, I think. Okay, so that's the problem. We took here a cubic, three-connected planar graph, and we found a Hamiltonian cycle. So, we proved Tate's conjecture, right? Okay, so except um, Tate had other ideas, right? And Tate's other ideas were, were that <laughs> the conjecture fails. So he was doing this work in the evening at Bletchley Park, but he wasn't uh, solving uh, the Lorentz code. This is an example they constructed by hand. There were, um, they actually had computers at Bletchley Park that they used to solve the Lorentz code, but um, of course they weren't using them to do these kinds of puzzles and they weren't sophisticated enough to do them. Anyway, this is a, an example. It does not have, it's a cubic three-dimensional planar graph, it doesn't have a Hamiltonian sign. It turns out the smallest such example, um, which was 
fan of my computer has got 38 bits. So this is pretty good. You do this by hand and you discover this in your, in your off time. You discover a counterexample or conjecture that's, what, how old was that? 62 years old? How hard is it to prove this thing is reconnected? To prove that this is reconnected? It's not hard at all. Yes, it's just it's just a question of checking. And you can sort of look at it. I mean, what are you trying to do? You're trying to pull it apart by taking out two vertices. Well, I don't think you have to take out three. I'll have to take out two. You don't have to take out two. All right, that's and what I'm If you can if you can pull it apart by taking out two vertices, then it's not three connected. Otherwise, it is. So it's clear that taking out one vertex never disconnects. And it's also clear that there's a massive amount of symmetry in this. And you can exploit that symmetry. Okay. So it's not a difficult, not a difficult tool. How hard is it to show that it that it um, does not have a Hamiltonian cipher? Yeah, that it sort it of comes about because uh, you have to think about these the way these three pieces are glued together. It's not that hard. So it's because of, because of the symmetry of the pieces that you can do it. But then why couldn't you shrink down the pieces into small? I guess you can for 38, but it just seems like... Okay. The shrinking, you've got to be careful about shrinking things because you can create Hamiltonian circuits when you start shrinking Hamiltonian circuits. I assume the minimal counterexample is a near resource symmetric. Uh, I don't know what the minimal counterexample is look like. But this is a, I think, I think this piece is called a tuck fragment. There are, as you can see, there are three orders of two together. Did they uh, prove that it's the smallest, or it's just the smallest? Yes, they proved that it's the smallest. So that's, I mean, these, uh, Brendan Mackay, uh, these, these people are both Australians. Uh, <laughs> and you had an Australian here last week. I think the only people in the world who actually do mathematics are Australians, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Carol? <laughs> Sorry. I have to, I'm also an American citizen now, although because I'm also on a, continue to be an Australian citizen, I'm sort of persona non grata here at the Mobile Academy, but they don't regard me as being good enough. Being a dual citizen is... You're good enough, James. We don't feel that way about you. Oh yeah, that's what you say, but that's not what the people say at the entry gate. <laughs> okay, so take got back to this problem in 1956. And, okay, the conjecture was wrong, but the conjecture had an idea in it which was right. Okay? <laughs> that planar graphs have Hamiltonian cycles as long as you make the connectivity high enough. Right? Three connected wasn't high enough, but four connected is. Okay? Take away this. So what does four connected means? It means that, well, you tell me, what is four connected? How many vertices do I need to remove? At least four to disconnect. Right, good. So the cubic went away here? Is the cubic's gone away, yeah. So that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you... Oh, you did start in 1945, Tuck went back to Trinity College in Cambridge. Uh, He'd done this top secret work at Bletchley Park. Uh, it wasn't sufficiently top secret for him not to be awarded a fellowship at Trinity College, Cambridge, for the top secret work that he'd done. So somehow, you know, it's a question of these you know, levels of British society. It got through to them that he'd done this major thing and he was elected a fellow of uh, Trinity College, which is being a likely a faculty member. And, and, you know, it's the most prestigious of colleges in Cambridge. He started his, 19, uh, his PhD studies in 1945. He worked with Sean Wiley, who worked with at Bletchley Park. And his thesis was called An Algebraic Theory of Graphs in 1948. Now, PhD thesis in maths. If, if, if you're a student, you don't know how long these things are. How long was your? Yeah, 100, 150. 100, 150 pages is about normal. Maybe even less. 
Some of them are very, very short. Tut's thesis was 417 pages. Okay? And it was really a, a fantastic piece of work. And he did this work in graph theory. And, and Carol and I owe a huge debt to the fact that he continued because what his advisor said to him was drop graph theory and take up something respectable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But he stuck with graph theory and I mean it really paid off. He, I mean he, he was just really the leading figure in graph theory and matroid theory in the 20th century, without a doubt. Okay. From his thesis, there's a result called the one factor theorem. Now, what's a one factor? Well, let me go back. You may know it under the name of a perfect matching. So a perfect matching is a set of edges in a graph which hit every vertex exactly once. Can you see a perfect matching in there? All the diagonal lines? Yeah, exactly. All the diagonal lines. Go from inside to outside. That's a perfect matching. Now, if a graph is going to have a perfect matching, what can you tell me about the parity of the number of vertices? It's even, right? <laughs> Every edge hits two vertices, and you hit all the vertices, so the number of vertices is even. So you're not going to have a perfect matching unless the number of vertices is even. Now, suppose that I were to take away one vertex. vertices of odd degree do I have in that? That's even. That's odd. That's even. That's odd. That's odd. That's odd. And that's even. So you'll see in a minute why I'm quite clear about that. So we know what a perfect match is. The number of components with an odd number of vertices. Oh, so I'm, I'm, I steered you in the wrong direction. <laughs> that was clever. Okay, so this has got seven vertices. Okay, I took away one vertex and I got one odd component. If the original graph was going to have a matching, this has got an odd number of vertices. I've only got one more vertex to put back in. Can you see that there has to be at most one component with an odd number of vertices? Suppose I had a second component with an odd number of vertices. I'm going to run into trouble. So that was Tut's theorem. A graph has a one factor exactly when Every time you remove a set of vertices, the number of components with an odd number of vertices is less than or equal to the number of vertices that you remove. And it's an if and only if statement. It's a characterization. Now, this was in his PhD thesis. If you do a course in graph theory, you do this theory. So if you can, in your PhD thesis, produce a theorem, which is in every basic graph theory course, if you're doing pretty well. What's a minor in a graph? Well, we talked about K5 and K33, and I said that these two guys were in every non-planar graph in some way. What do I mean by in one of the other? One or the other. Yes, one or the other, exactly. Um, here are two operations, deletion and contraction. So look at this graph here. And if I delete the vertex, the, the edge 6, 
Well, you can see what I've done. I've just taken the thing and gone. Now, what did I do when I contracted the N6? Can you see what's happened? Just sort of smooshed it together. Right? You've essentially shrunk it. So I just haven't contracted to that. Okay. Those are deletion and contraction. And they're two basic operations that you can do in graphs. And if you do a series of those operations, you get what's called a minor of a graph. So when I talked about not having K5 and not having K3 through inside of a graph when it's not planned, you don't have it as a minor. You can't get it by sequence of deletions and contraction. So there's, there's nothing in your definition of a graph that precludes multiple edges? No, there's nothing that precludes multiple Also in Tut's thesis was um, something that later appeared in a paper called the Ring and Graph Theory. That appeared in 1947. And he looked at the number of spanning trees in a connected graph. Now, what's a spanning tree? Make sure that I hit every vertex, but I don't have any side So have I done it? Do I hit every vertex? Yes. Do I have any cycles? Any closed paths? No. That's a spanning tree. Do you also want connected? Yes. Yes. So as Max said, I, I admitted to say we're connected. I won't be in one place. Okay. So this is a spanning tree of this graph. Now, Tut was interested in this. Again, this came out of work with a four. There's an interesting recursion for the spanning trees. Take an edge which is not a loop and not a cut edge. Now what's a loop? That's a loop. An edge that joins a vertex to the set. And the cut edge is something that breaks apart the graph apart into two pieces when you remove it. So that's a cut edge. So I'm picking an edge which is not a loop and it's not a cut edge. And then you've got this beautiful recursion, a deletion with contraction recursion. The number of spanning trees in the graph is the number in the deletion plus the number in the contraction. Now, how do you prove something like that? Well, what you say is, take all the spanning trees. Either they contain the edge or they don't. If the edge is not in the spanning tree, then it's a spanning tree of the deletion. And if the edge is in the spanning tree, contract that edge, and now you've got a spanning tree of the contraction. And that's it. So, the first class, the spanning trees that don't use the edge, they're spanning trees in the deletion. And the spanning trees in the contraction match up with those here, those that use it. And Tuff said that he, I wondered if complexity or tree number could be characterized by the above identity alone and decided that it could not. Um, here's another instance where a deletion contraction recursion comes up. I want to colour the vertices of a graph and I want to do it with K colours. 
So, where's my graph here? Um, so I'd like to color the vertices of this graph, and I'd like to color it with a smaller number of colors as I can, with the requirement that I'm coloring the vertices. And if two vertices are joined by an edge, they get different colors. So I'm, this is highly symmetric. I'll color this vertex one. I'm trying to use the smallest number of colors that I can. So I'm going to get, this is going to be two, and this is going to be two. How many colors do I need? I have to have three, right? And it's because it's, it's, because it's an odd sign. So this could be one, but now I'm stuck. This can't be one and it can't be two, it has to be three. Okay. So this graph has no two colorings, proper two coloring, but it does have three colors. Okay. And here's another deletion contraction. Look at the number of colorings of G deleted with K colors. That's the number of G plus the number of G contract. Okay. How do you prove that? Well, take it, it's got distinct endpoints you do it with. We're looking at the colorings in G delete E. Either U and V get different colors. in which case I've got a colouring of G. Or they get the same colour, in which case I can contract them. And I get a colour in So I went a bit too fast over that. But that deletion contraction recursion is absolutely fundamental to stuff that Tut does. He focused on these two recursions. This deletion contraction one, and another one which is a product recursion which holds when you've got two disjoint graphs, two graphs that don't have any vertices. And that fundamental recursion, those two fundamental recursions, lead to what subsequently came to be called the top polynomial for graphs and also for matrix. Okay, so let's go. I'm going to stay with graphs. I'm not going to mention matroids. The reason I'm not going to mention matroids is that um, you seem to be doing fine with graphs, and you don't really want to know about matroids. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Carolyn. Look at the lines that have come on the post. <laughs> matroids are a struggle. You don't want to go there. Okay. <laughs> So we've got a three-connected simple graph, and I want to know which one can't be built from a smaller three-connected simple graph by uncontracting or undeleting a single edge. So why don't we go back to our friend McHugh? If I contract this edge here, so that's going to shrink it down. So it's going to go. This is still three connected, and it's still simple. Simple means no cycles of length two. So I can get this graph from this graph by a simple uncontraction. Are there any graphs that I can't build up from? Just one edge by undeleting or uncontracting? Yeah, you've got to do 
too good of a Go stop signing treatment. It explains this guy that lives like four vertebrae. What's the smallest four vertebrae? Well, if it's slip connected and it's got four vertices, it looks like that. Yeah. <laughs> the mastitis plate. Now, can we generalise this mastitis plate? That's K4, yes. But K4, K4 is not the right generalisation. Uh, I've drawn this. Yes. So, what do I do? Yeah, put more space. And so that is actually called a wheel in graph theory. And now, if you want to get, if you want to build that from a smaller three-connected graph, how can you do it? You can't. Take away an edge, it's not three-connected anymore because you can remove those two vertices. Uh, take away that edge, not three-connected anymore because you can take away these two vertices. So you can't delete. And if you contract any edge, because you've got all these cycles of length three, you're going to get cycles of length two. Okay. So these are the only graphs that can't be so constructed. The three connected simple graph has an end so that you can delete it or contract it and stay three connected and simple unless G is, and you know the answer, Amy said, it's a wheel. So that's Tut's wheel theorem. And he generalized this to matroids in 1966 with the wheels and whirls theorem. The first conference in matroids was in 1964. Tut gave some lectures that were quite famous at that conference. And he wrote about this. To me, that was the year of the coming of the matroids, 1964. Then and there, the theory of matroids was proclaimed to the mathematical world. And outside the halls of lecture, there arose the repeated cry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he had a sense of humour. <laughs> so let me talk about Tut's contributions to mathematics. Uh, he had 160 publications. For a mathematician to have 50 publications is really pretty good in the career. Uh, 160 is fantastic. Um, citations. If you look at Math Sinet, they really start counting in, in uh, the year 2000 in Math Sinet. He's got 3,500 citations, about 200 a year. Uh, and remember, he's not publishing anymore, so this is old stuff. He, had, he was the first editor-in-chief of the Journal of Combinatorial Theory, which is the most famous um, discrete mathematics journal. It was founded in 1967. And he had eight PhD students. Some of you will know the names of Rod Mullen and Neil Roberts, and they'd be the most famous. And his work at Bletchley Park, uh, the British Prime Minister David Cameron wrote a letter to his niece. He had no children. But she, David Cameron wrote a letter to uh, Jean Yildon, who was Tut's niece, in uh, 2012, saying that. He noted the extent to which the work of the Bletchley Park cryptographers, like Professor Tuck, not only helped Britain itself, but also shortened the war by an estimated two years, saving countless lives. So this was, I mean, this was a fantastic achievement. And um, I mentioned before that um, contribution that Dwight Eisenhower had pointed to about one of the greatest intellectual feats of the Second World War. That was something that also appeared on the citation that he got when he received the office of the Order of Canada. Can you see that? That's a monument to Tuck 
which was opened in 2013 at Newmarket, which is where he was born in 1917. And it's to commemorate his work in um, code breaking, but there are other things around there that talk about the, the problem about dissecting the square into unequal squares. Now one of the things that I'm going to conclude with uh, something that Tuck did as a member of the four, they had a, a mathematical poetess that they invented. Her name was Blanche Descartes. And any one of them could contribute to the works of Blanche Descartes. But Tut was probably the most prolific one. And I was at his con the conference for his 80th birthday at the University of Waterloo in 1997. And he declaimed this poem by Blanche Descartes at the 80th birthday dinner. And it's a beautiful poem, and I'll, I'll recite it to you in a moment. But the next day I saw him in the corridor, and I said, have you got a copy of this um, poem? And he just handed me the original. He went to his office and he handed me the original. So I have Tut's original of this, uh, what's called the three houses problem. Okay. So the three houses. In central Spain, in mainly Rome, three houses stood upon the plain. The houses of our mystery, to which from realms of industry came pipes and wires to light and heat, and other pipes with waters sweep. The owners said, where these things cross, burn, leak, or short, will suffer loss. So let a graph man living near plan each from each to keep them clear. Tell them, graph man, come in vain. They'll bear the cross that must remain. Explain the plainness of the plain. <laughs> Thank you. That's the Enigma machine, and it was the Enigma machine that was solved by Turing and so on. And one of the things that's in that um, BBC documentary about the lost heroes of Bletchley Park is that the narrator says it's as if the public only has room for one set of actors on the stage, and that set of actors is, uh, well, Alan Turing and his group and the Enigma machine. But there was another group and that consisted of Bill Tutt and a famous um, electrical engineer, Tommy Flowers, who built a Colossus machine, really the first computer, that they used to solve the Lorenz machine. So it's inappropriate for Tutt to have the Enigma machine because he never saw the Lorenz machine and he never really worked on the Enigma machine, he worked on the Lorenz machine. Which Lorenz is this? Is his name after? You know? It, it, I don't know. It was a, it was a German High Command who used this machine. It's L O R E N Z, E N Z. Sorry. And there are a lot of resources online. There's a built-up memorial uh, website that you can find. Bletchley Park has its own website. You can find a lot of these things out online. Um, what I talked about with the squaring the square, that's also online. So th there's a lot of biographical stuff about Tuttle and um, We who work in that area owe him a huge debt. But it, it's not just, the, what I wanted to get across to you was that this business about shortening the war by two years with a mathematician who just wrote down all of these strings of numbers and, and spotted the patterns in them. And this pattern spotting, which is what we all do in mathematics, the fact that one could use this to save lives is, is really, you know, just brings, brings you out in chills, I think. Doesn't matter. Yes? I'm going to be a troublemaker. Okay. Uh, we had a Canadian graph theorist in this department named Bruce Richter. Yes. Who eventually went on back to Canada. I believe he's still active. He's at the University of Waterloo, indeed. Right. 
he was complaining to me one day about how difficult it was to read Tut's papers. And I said, is that because Tut is so much smarter than everybody else? And Bruce said, well, that's certainly a large part of it. But no, his papers are more opaque than they need to be. Gary, comment? Yes, I think that, I think that that's true. Um, he had amazing insights, and he wrote a little book on matroid theory. And I have, um, it would be okay that he, if he used different terms for the terms that everybody else uses. But he doesn't do that. He uses the same terms that everybody else uses, but with different meanings. <laughs> okay, so that makes this stuff very hard to read. And he had, but look, I mean, it's easy to say his stuff was hard to read, and that's absolutely true. And he actually lamented that somewhat um, in the coming of the Matroids. He sort of said, that, you know, he doesn't really understand why people didn't like his approach. Um, you can poo-poo this if it comes from some crackpot. But if it comes from someone who proves these profound theorems, you've got to say, well, look, he's got some insights by thinking about these things in his way that are, that are you know, much deeper than the insights that other people have got. And have I ever read any of his papers? The answer is pretty. Unless, I mean, the coming of the Matrix is an easy paper to read, but, but no, I haven't waded through the details of it many of his papers because they really are hard to read. And I think he was just he was just a, a very gifted guy, but he wasn't a gifted expositor. Obviously. It sounds like he may have inherited this from Sean Wiley because the, the homology theory book by uh, Hilton and Wiley introduced this radical new notation, none of which caught on, which makes the book very hard to read. Yeah, I think Hilton was also a lecture poet, wasn't he? But yes, he was. Yes. In fact, he's given, he gave talks for that. So there were, I mean, there were some fantastic mathematicians there. And, and the thing about Tut being hired at Bletchley Park was that um, he was just recommended, he was a chemistry student, and he was recommended that, you know, this is a bright kid, get him, we've got tough problems to work on, get in there. And so he, he worked on these things. One uh, technical question. You mentioned this great theorem that every four connected planar graph has a Hamiltonian cycle. Yes, that's very nice. Um, what, what's known if you uh, if you change planar to genus one or change the topology on which the graph is allowed to, to reside? Uh, is there some? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not really a graph theorist. I'm just sort of pretending to be one today. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought it would be better, I thought it would, the talk would be more appropriate if I, if I spoke really just about graph theory. But I, I don't know enough of this stuff. Um, but there are... 